I tell Mike Feinberg all the time, if I were 25 years younger, I would be a Kipster. So I grew up in the neighborhood where Mike and Dave Levin first did Teach for America north side of Houston, three blocks away from Sam Houston High School. Um, I'm a product of HISD Middle Schools, Burbank Vanguard. And so I know a little bit about what it's like to get out of the neighborhood, but also be a part of a really cool go college going culture, which Burbank had built a very fantastic program back in the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s. So just uh, I want to add that context because that really drives how I think about college going cultures in different competencies, especially for a diverse demographic. So I just wanted to, to share that with you as well. Well, I grew up on the north side of Houston in Indiana. Houston's really big, so the north side in Bloomington, Indiana, so a little different. We're going to go through a few slides. We ran out of time in the first session, so I don't think we need to spend as much time focusing on what the crisis is out there and, and the world in which we're working. But if you want just, you know, why, why you should care about college-going cultures, We've, we've teed up some slides that we use when we go speak to our partners in higher education. This slide was deliberately built for their eyes, I mean for us as well as, as educators, but we built this slide to just show them, hey guys, we have a crisis and oh by the way, it's not impacting the, the top quartile income families. It's the middle and lower income students that are really being affected here. So 31% are graduating with a four-year degree. Of, of, of families bet uh, between the ages of 25 and 29 have a degree. 82 percent in the same age group in the top quartile have a degree. 8 percent in the low quartile have a degree in the same age group. So it's the what and we just wanted to tee that up for you guys. I think you know we're all in the same, we're in the same schools, same districts, serving the same neighborhoods and zip codes that we all understand where, what we're facing as far as college completion is concerned and how that impacts college readiness and I guess why Rice is hosting the summit here today. And I would just add one thing that wasn't said about my background is as Kip Houston, we now have 21 schools in Houston and Galveston. About eight years ago, we had four. So as we grew from four schools to 21, which is pretty quick, very quick, I also served in the role as chief academic officer for us. And when I see the eight, I just want you to know that I think of eight children. I'm sure we all do. Eight individual children with very different backgrounds and very different circumstances. And I also think of the 92 that didn't. And so when we were building out our entire pre-K-12 model, and Brian's taking it through 16, it's about the individual faces and names that we ourselves are thinking about to make this work very real and very emotional and very personal for us. Personal in a way. I, you know, in the first session, I was telling Elliot, man, it was completely filled. Lots of colleagues from across the city and the region, which is always stressful because you're like, okay, we talk about this stuff offline all the time, and we're presenting, so hopefully I'm saying this in a way in which it's, it's you know, it's going to be, it'll impact their work. Um, but first session, I had my, my son's current associate principal from Kingwood Park, and now I have his former principal from uh, Kingwood Middle School, Lisa Bolig. So, you know, tough crowd, man. I, I'm talking to folks that are that are working very near and dear to my heart. So, um, it's she can't change any grade. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, um, one thing I want to flag on this slide for you guys, as we talk about diversity, and here I'm really focusing on the Hispanic population in Texas. If you look at the numbers with African American, the, the growth isn't, as, isn't the same as far as the, the, the population, as far as how it's expanding and growing in numbers, but the numbers as far as college going uh, rates are pretty much the same. But the Hispanic population in Texas, we all know, is increasing. And you can see since 2000, post-secondary enrollment for Hispanics in our state has increased by almost 75%. Over the past decade, um, 72% of those students, Hispanics, on average, have enrolled in a two-year college. So we have a lot of work to do as we, as we think through four-year four degrees from our African-American and Hispanic populations. 
Can you skip the destination postcard? Yep. We're going to skip a few slides because we know the crisis and we're here for a reason. And rather than belabor the point and talk more about data, we want to kind of cut to the chase programmatically of what we've done and how we've been able to move the needle. The thing that I think is most important is all of us in this room, as I was walking around, I saw different organizations, different districts, different circumstances. KIPP is a charter. There are lots of not charters in here. So what I would suggest is rather than say that's a charter, that's not a charter, imagine where or name, feel, experience exactly where your sphere of influence is and now imagine five years from now what it could be. And when I think about that, I think about designing that postcard in our imagination of where we would like to see the culture of our organization be in the future. We're not happy and we're not satisfied where we are right now as an organization. Only about 40% of our kids have graduated. We still have an, a, a few more that are on the way, but we want that 40 to be 75, 80, 95, 100. So we have five-year goals that Brian will talk about. Think about the future for the, for the school you represent or the organization you represent, and just imagine what would the culture feel like be like? What would kids celebrate? What would teachers high five about? What would administrators talk to the Chronicle about? If we truly had a college bound and college going culture that had been embedded in the DNA and fabric of our school. And wherever we are vis-a-vis -vis that future, that's what we're going to try to help this community bridge. So with the, with the thought partner next to you, share what that might look like. Take about three to four minutes. Share what that destination postcard is to yourself uh, with a thought partner, and we'll bring us back together in about four minutes. That's good. I forgot that part. You're on. You're here. How, much, how important is this? Probably not. Gotcha. And this, like, that's important. We can jump into the programmatic stuff. So. This is, like, the, the problem with these slides are that anyone with a yes but in this room is going to say, but we can't do that. So, I would, I would touch on different pieces. It's important to have a mission, a mission that describes that future. Let's just go straight to this slide. Maybe while I summarize, I'll say, you know, we have some missions written in here that you can rip off if you want. The most important thing is to have a mission that describes and names that. Twenty sixteen. Okay. And then a couple more minutes. Ahead. Jaguars, Jacksonville, auditioning head coach, quarterback, new owner. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> On Monday Night Football. Can <laughs> you bring us back? There's no easy way to get everyone back, so I was going to try the hand in the air or snaps or something, but... Whatever that vision is five years from now, one thing that we're going to skip ahead to show you, and it's in your packet so you don't need it, the specific language, is a mission that describes that. And what's important to me and Kip Houston is that we talk about every single kid. It's a national debate that we would love to have, which is, should you count the kids who walk across a stage, or should you count the kids that are in your building from the beginning? We choose to count the kids that are in our building from the beginning, which means that not all our kids have graduated. We could easily say 100% of the kids who graduated from our high schools graduated from our high schools. 
but that's true, but also very fuzzy. We try to count every single kid. And then the second thing that I'm excited about is that we're focused on college and beyond. At this point, we know the numbers. It's not enough just to get a college degree. We also want our kids to be able to be gainfully employed. And the numbers there are pretty awful nationally as well. And then we also have a mission that's specific to what we call KIPP through college, which is a program that we're gonna describe in great detail that helps us think through how to groom and cultivate a culture that helps create kids, create is the wrong word, develop kids who go all the way through college, not just to it. So we're gonna dive right in. This is, and we lost time in the last session. We spent too much time on the data. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about the specific competencies, components, programs that we, that we put into play. So this is slide 15, yes. These are, again, our slide 16. So these are five buttons that we, again, when we're talking to our potential higher education partners, um, external partners that are going to support the work that we do, this is really important for us because we want them to understand all the moving parts that we have at play on any given day in a KIPP school, KIPP classroom, individually as we're talking to KIPsters. So I'll, I'm going to focus on the bottom three buttons. I'm going to let Elliot take the top two. The right match college, the right match high school because we're working with our middle school students as well. Um, social and academic integration, um, the social capital, cultural capital. Uh, Mr. Whitney was talking about how we actually impress on the students uh, the, the, the greatest hits of Eagles Volume 1 and 2, making sure that they understand what Hotel California is and all the lyrics to that song because they will sing it at, at some point during their college career or any other Top 40 song, you name it. We want our kids to be well versed in where they're going so that way they don't feel like they need to self-remove or isolate themselves. Uh, college affordability, financial understanding, very deliberate about how we work with that as well. So we'll talk more about that in a few more slides. But the right match, high school and college, especially for the demographics that we serve, first generation, um, parents may not have gone to a top you know, high, uh, selective high school. They may not have gone to a magnet or a vanguard high school. Uh, definitely probably didn't go to a college or a university. We have to be very deliberate about the, rat, the right match as far as high school and college, uh, where they're going to be placed in the college. Give you an example of what I'm talking about. I shared uh, an unfortunate, one of our original KIPP students from KIPP Houston High School, class of 08, maxed out all the metrics. I mean, he had an amazing SAT. He had a 4.2 GPA. He had taken all the AP courses we had to offer at Kip Houston High School. Very, very uh, kind-hearted kid. He started all these amazing organizations. He applied for QuestBridge, was matched by QuestBridge, wasn't I had no voice in that. I mean, I pushed them. I said, that's not going to be the right choice school for that kid. Please listen to me. Uh, uh, Claremont McKenna wanted this particular student. Um, QB put him at Claremont McKenna out on the West Coast. I knew that was going to be a challenge. Um, it was the only option for him at that point since it was a binding agreement, full, full ride to Claremont McKenna. And so he was an engineering student. I just I knew this was going to be a challenge for him. He gets out there. And three semesters later, he's back home studying at a local university. And then two semesters now have passed, and he's, he's actually withdrawing from this university and going off to the Navy. Do I chalk that up as a, as, as a loss, a success, a defeat, a victory? I mean, we can debate that. But I do know one thing. We invested a lot of time into this young man from fifth through twelfth grade. Um, individual time, team time, and grade levels, uh, college counseling. I, you know, I, was, I worked with this young man, Luis uh, Rivera. And so to me, that's not the right return on investment that I'm looking at in regards to the outcome that I hope to have for my students. Um, and it has nothing to do with going to the Navy at all. It, it, but it is about, you know, we were deliberate about a certain set of things we wanted for this young man. And the match school was what, in my opinion, hurt him the most. Um, so we have to be really, really deliberate about where they're going to college, when we think about support systems, when we think about financial support, all those pieces, culture, you know, et cetera. And there's so many other factors involved in that, but the right match. I know there was a session on that earlier today, so we don't need to unpack that. Um, social and academic integration. You know, <laughs> we can talk about this a lot as well. We've sent students to Vanderbilt, <clears throat> to Tufts. 
Uh, Tufts is now becoming an issue for us. It's, I don't know if any of you guys have students at Tufts or not in the Boston area, but our students for some reason are having a hard time adjusting to the Tufts campus. Not quite sure what's going on up there, so I need to take a trip out there and see you know, what's happening. Any Tufts alumni in the room, by the way? Any Tufts administrators? Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's, there's apparently something going on now that I've had three calls from our students in different levels of you know, freshmen, sophomore, and juniors. Uh, and we have a young man who is ready to come home this Christmas and not go back. And we're just like, whoa, what, wait a minute, what's going on? So we think about the social competencies, the culture building. Uh, we have to make sure our kids have the social capital and the culture capital to navigate a crisis when, this crisis, when they're confronted with this crisis. And, and then resolve that crisis and move on. Uh, I told the, the University of Houston president, Dr. Couture, about three months back, she was asking, why is this partnership important to you guys, University of Houston and Kip Houston? I said, well, if our students are on their way from their house in the north side of Houston to class on any Thursday afternoon and they have, their car breaks down, that's a crisis that, could, that will be a reason to self-remove from, from school that semester, believe it or not. If my son... Kingwood, you know, middle school, Kingwood Park, is on his way to U of H, breaks down, he will pick up the phone, Dad, I um, broke down, can you come help me? There's a huge difference. And so when I expressed that to her, she's like, uh, social and academic integration. Uh, affordability of college and financial understanding. Has anybody seen any of the financial aid packages coming down the pike? Well, last spring, let's use last spring. Pretty, pretty, pretty scary. Uh, they're gapping our kids by $10,000, $15,000, $25,000, $30,000, and then using the language that they've met need or demonstrated need. Some of the, the annual cost of a, of, a, of a college degree is more than our, our families' homes. And so our kids look at those numbers, and they can't, they can't switch between investment and expense. Investment and expense. So we have to talk to our families about that affordability and financial understanding of how you invest in your education and what's a healthy way to do that. We, we, we have some pretty cool things going on in Kip Houston with savings accounts and all kinds of things, so we can talk about that after a while. And then I'd like to touch on the top two, and, and, and they're all integrated. It's pretty hard to talk about one in isolation of the other. So a kid who's academically ready, but is, I'm co-signing a $16,000 loan with Chase to let her go off to California. If she wasn't academically ready, that 16 would have become another 16, and I'm not co-signing on $32,000 in loans, I can tell you that much. But because she was academically ready, she could write really, really well and think really, really well. She was, after freshman year, had a 3.7. Contrast that with a lot of other kids that are not getting renewed on financial aid or their financial aid is increasing year two because they simply weren't ready. And that's ultimately what I think we have to figure out. I think STAR, readiness standards, all that stuff is helpful. It's nice to have TCCRS out there in, in Texas. At the same time, there are a lot of other factors that play into academic readiness, writing, creative thinking, curiosity, et cetera, that we've known kids who are do well, kids who aren't, aren't doing well. And then I think what differentiates us from some places is that we're explicit about teaching character and developing character in our kids. In my opinion, as a middle school leader, it's more important to me that a kid holds the door for somebody than it is if they got a 71 or 74 on some common assessment. And I know that's controversial. We all have to make our own decisions. To me, I wanna foster and develop kids who have those different character traits that lots of different people have isolated as the seven that are most important for kids who progress through school. So one suggestion, if you want to make a note, is go back to each of those and with your teams figure out where are we intentionally developing grit? Are we ever allowing our kids to fail? And if we are, what do we do then? Do we wave at them and say, sorry, sucka, or are we consciously trying to help them develop through that so that they can then apply those personal skills into the future. So we're going to brag a little bit. Yeah, we're going to brag a little bit here. Uh, class of 2000 uh, will be done this May, hopefully in four years. Some are going to persist for, on a five-year rate, six-year rate. Kip Houston had a total of about 90 alums. Um, 82% of those were fifth graders, and you can see we've broken it out for you guys and where they matriculated. 
most important to us, 85% of these kids are first generation to college, parents that did not graduate high school. 60% are on track to graduate from college in five years or less. And so when you talk about achievement gaps, you, you know, we've, we've basically collapsed that gap from the 9% the or the 8%, depending on which, which research you're looking at, and low SES students of color, we're, we're, times, we're times 10, times, times 9. So we, we think we're doing some pretty, you know, important work. Um, do we have lots to, do we still have a lot to learn as we grow the number of KIPsters we're serving? Because I can promise you, this rate will dip. We will see a dip in the number of kids completing in four or five years with the class of 9, 10, 11, and 12, and then hopefully we'll see it bounce back up. So, you know, we know we've got, we've got a lot, lot of work to do still. To that point, two of the most important components. Um, I'm going to talk about the, 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 the right side, college knowledge. It's, it's everything that, that college counselors do. It's everything that AVID guidance counselors do. It's those explicit executive thinking skills we want all of our students to, to possess when they leave us in whatever grade level we're, 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 we're talking about. What are the seventh grade outcomes? For Kip Houston, it's about relationships and communication. We think you have to have those two competencies in order to build in the, the work we want to build in in eighth grade. In eighth grade, we want them to demonstrate some leadership skills. We also want them to become self-advocates. Mom, I don't want to go to X high school because this high school has a science and engineering team. That's executive thinking. They're, 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 they're deliberate about those moves. And sometimes there are three steps involved, sometimes there are five steps involved, but at least they're thinking about the steps in that process. And if you think about it, that's a competency that's transferable to science, math, writing. You know, we, we have to think in, 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 these, in, these, in these buckets or these competencies, if we're just teaching to the application process, no good. They will never see that application process ever again. But if we're teaching competencies and using the application process as an exercise, then that's fascinating. And then on the left side, every organization has to decide what success looks like. And we have some friendly debates. I know Spring Branch has been articulate about not wanting to measure the worth of individual graduates and what place they go next. To us, the most important thing is that when a kid's sitting here, they're not confused or lost or needing remedial reading or math in order to learn as a freshman. So we're explicit about that. And again, it's aspirational. We're not hitting it with all our kids. There are definitely a lot of our kids that need remedial math and reading. Our goal is to close that so that whether a kid goes to Permian Basin or Kingwood or wherever, Kingwood, Kingsville, or wherever they go, Rice, Stanford, Tufts, that when they're sitting in that class, they're not confused or needing remedial work. And that's obviously puts us in a place where star in the OC isn't our bar and isn't what we're about. So just to build a little bit more or take a deeper dive in the college knowledge, um, Karis McGahee, I know she's doing a session right now on Epic. I'm not sure, uh, she was the keynote speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Conley has done some amazing work in the, for the past, over the past 10 years, and a lot of work here in Texas with the TCCRSs, and he's helped you know, with the, uh, the review of the college board and the syllabi that are submitted for AP work. So he understands Texas very well. And s what I love about his work is, and this is all his language, is that systemic understanding of the application processes, or better yet, we talk about using agendas in middle schools or in high school. And this is something that I, you know, I look at some of the middle schools, but there's only maybe one class or one department that really uses the agenda. It's no good unless the entire school is using it and building this, this push where the entire school is using the same agenda, the same board configuration, students see processes and systems, and then they begin to say, oh, okay, gotcha. There's an organization component to this, and that's what makes the, the beautiful part of KIPP through college even more of an impact. Because if I'm doing KIPP through college lessons in seventh grade in only one middle school or in only a certain series of course classes at that middle school, it doesn't change college-going culture. And it, it, it just makes more work for my, my team, my staff, and the kids can't see the connections. And that's really where we get into trouble with the breakdown of a college-going culture. Um, human relation skills, again, with the students that I serve, and I would argue is probably for all of our middle and high school kiddos, that's, that's a big 
big challenge for them right now. Like they, they do not know how to approach an adult and say, wait a minute, I missed the homework assignment. Where was it placed again? That's foreign. I mean, I have to, every single night, and I have a ninth grader who I just, I got to look at his agenda. I got to pull it. I got to look online. Still not making the connections of where things need to go and why you have to ask about certain pieces. So those, those relationships that they're learning how to build and be resourceful, to me, that's college knowledge. That's where a kid, you can say, hey, go to the, the application, applytexas.org, get started on the application, I'll be back to check on you in about 20 minutes, and then you can move on to the next student. But they have to have these self-sufficiency skills, executive thinking skills, and that all comes through exercise. I'm going to go through these two. I, I spent some time talking about student development. I just want to flag for us students. I mean, there's, there's language out there with the psychosocial researchers. They talk about student change, student growth, and what's the best language to use. I think student development, to me, makes, makes more sense in Kip Through College and Kip Houston work, but challenge you to think about it. There's a lot of great research out there. Sanford, Rogers, Erickson, if you remember Erickson when you were doing your education coursework age-appropriate development, and if you think about a college application or college knowledge, what can you give a ninth grader that makes sense? FAFSA? No. What can you give an 11th grader that makes sense? FAFSA? Uh, maybe. Sometimes not even any of our seniors can handle the FAFSA, but, but they, they should have the competency or the, the, the brain should have been developed to the point where they can understand how to make that connection to, you know, where they're tracking. So student development, to me, that the word resonates when I think about age-appropriate skill sets and competencies. And sometimes, as we know, in middle school there are tensions. So if we want kids to self-advocate for themselves in seventh and eighth grade, well, you didn't give me... Let's try that again. Let's role play. There are better ways to do it, better ways to, articu to articulate yourself. Well, my teacher hates me. All right, let's unpack that, but let's really try to move on. You know, so... Just knowing the age appropriateness of what we're trying to cultivate and develop allows us to teach it to kids and help them role play through scenarios so that they're better at it. All right, we're going to get to the, the meat of our, the work that we're doing in Kip Houston. Again, skipping some slides. We're up to slide 23. Maybe it's 22. I don't know where you, what, what this is for you guys. 24, sorry. I'm going to again cover the bottom three. And so these are the same buttons that you saw earlier, but I just want to be really explicit about what we're doing with Kip Houston as we talk about concrete application of the theory. Institutional match, Kip through college team, advice, counsel, college counseling teams. Uh, I have, I've had this debate with my, uh, my colleagues in Kip across the country, and we now have 18, 19 high schools across the country, three here in Houston, five in the state of Texas, and I still find school leaders doing this. Art teacher working part-time, half-time doing college counseling with juniors and seniors. Or waiting till senior year using part-time art teacher because that's where that person has budgeted, allocated dollars. And I just, I, I, I hit my head because I'm thinking, you know, Kip through college, Kip is about going to college and finishing and completing the degree, but you can, you're still not investing in a college counselor or a program. So I, I just want to make sure that when we think about institutional match, you know, the application of it means as a school leader, administrator, we're being super thoughtful about what 12, 13 school year is, thinking about it right now. It means we're having ongoing debates about who is going to get hired for college counseling positions at Kip Sunnyside High School, Kip Generations Collegiate. We need someone who has working knowledge, strong command of the, of the, of the content, and oh yes, by the way, it is a profession. So I, I'll just stop there, but institutional match, that's how I'm, and, and as, as I talk about with school leaders, it, that's the direct application of it. Uh, so we have college counseling teams that have strong competencies. Um, social and academic integration, I think I talked a lot about that earlier, but one thing that we do very specifically with Kip, uh, Kipsters is that we have a Kip Alumni Association that we have private funders fund a team. Today at 3.30, I'm jumping in my van and going to San Antonio. We have a Kipster in crisis. We have a kid melting down uh, at UTSA. And I'm bringing together all of my Kipsters and taking them to dinner tonight, but I'm going specifically for this one young lady. She's a freshman. We feel that she's been with us since fifth grade. Return on education means it's a, it means enough for me to drive out there, 
45 bucks worth of gas, stay with some family, spend half my day there in the morning, and then come back. That's important. She sees the value, and I guarantee you that hopefully will keep her at UTSA and not self-remove. So That's social, good. I mean, uh, the, the connections. And as you think about your destination postcard, all of the districts in Houston and in the surrounding areas, there are alumni that have enormous pride in the schools that they attended. I coach varsity girls soccer at our high school. We play against schools that have enormous pride and decades of alumni. It wouldn't be far-fetched to imagine trying to reconnect with some of those alumni and foster an increased pride in the work that they've done. Because we're so young, it's pretty hard to find somebody who's now Donald Trump or Barbara Jordan or whomever, but it wouldn't be hard to find an enormous number of wildly successful people that have come from varied backgrounds in the districts represented in this community. So I wonder if part of college going culture is celebrating the success and to the kids marketing the success of the alumni, because it's actually pretty hard to market success if all they ever see are adults in the building who are often stressed out. <laughs> because being an adult doesn't look really fun when the principal's wagging his finger at a kid who wrote on the bathroom wall. But if, kid, if we want kids to fall in love with the idea of going to college, I would argue we have to market and celebrate what it means to be an adult who has gone to college. Top two. Sure. On the top two, we've already touched on it. I think the most important and the thing that we are weakest at is the critical thinking in KIPP. I think we're still evolving away from a tax toss focused culture and we're finally starting to see the real data that shows that if we're not fostering creative and critical thinking in our kids, it's game over for a lot of our children. And that's just reality. It's been written about a lot. When we actually look at this kid versus that kid who got the same ACT scores, the same GPA, this was a good writer, this student wasn't, it's radically different, their college and ultimately career experiences. So we actually don't really talk about tax scores, and our tax data is pretty awful. I just, I mean, I, I, I we don't even have longitudinal data, and I don't even look at it, to be honest with you. That's a little radical. I think I'm a little radical about it. More important to me is the kids who graduate and looking at their penance to see where they went to college. And then the last, I'll just touch on the bottom right here. Parental engagement. Uh, again, we're nimble, we're small, we're a charter. We can do this. Uh, parental engagement, family connection series, whatever that, whatever that might look like at your campuses. I can't stress, you know, again for our students, we have to keep our parents connected monthly each semester. We have deliberate sessions that we call family connection series where we're talking about college, high schools, financial support, whatever it might be. We're being super deliberate about having those conversations and working with uh, an external partner to build out what that looks like for primary uh, families as well because we know that if we don't capture them pre-fifth grade, man, our work becomes, it's so hard in middle school and high school to get caught back up with some of the, f the parents because their mentality is the older they get into school, the less involved I need to be. And for us, we know that the older they get, man, we need those parents in the building more often in the high schools than we do in the primary schools. And parents think that primary, you know, going to the, 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 the science fairs and the, you know, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scout meetings, that's, that's, that's where, you know, and then passing them off to us as middle schoolers and high school leaders, uh -uh. It's, I think it's, it's inverse. It should be the opposite, but, you know, it's, that's, that's the demographic that we serve. So specifically, we have, we've just sort of bullet pointed out some, some things that we do. We can talk through some of these just to give you, again, some more specific application to the work of College Going Cultures. Um, one of the things that I love the most about KIPP, when I first came to KIPP, was I, I didn't realize this wall of honor, this golden wall that's on KIPP Academy Middle School or the Southwest campuses, it's a huge wall. It's about 40 foot high, and it has these college pennants. And then underneath each pennant, there's a black plaque with the name of a student and class they were promoted out of eighth grade. I always get confused on this. And so that's their last eighth grade homework assignment. They give the kids these black plaques, has their, 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 their uh, graduating class or their promoting class, and they're charged with coming back to the 
the pennant ceremony, which happens every first Thursday of the year in January. We'll have it in three weeks at, down at the Arena Theater. If you want to go, we'd love to have you out there. And our college students come back after their first semester in college. They bring us their pennant and their plaque, and it goes up on the Wall of Honor. <coughs> and I just thought, wow, that's a super cool last eighth grade homework assignment. And I found out very soon that they don't keep the plaques, and so we have to order more plaques. And but it's it's just a really cool. They remember they remember getting these plaques, and the plaque turns red when they graduate from college, BA, BS, BBA, turns blue when it's a master's, and we just turned our first one into white. We have a we now have a lawyer in the family, JD. So she's a, a, a doctor of jurisprudence, and so this this visual anchor that these uh, PK3 kids first graders, second graders, third graders, they're seeing it as they go to their buses every day. They sit in front of the Wall of Honor, they're looking up at all these pennants from across the country and all these plaques. It's, it's, that was one of the most fascinating things that I saw when I first came onto the team. But That was a really cool uh, example of building a college-going culture. Um, second one, the golden ticket. You know, Mike Feinberg and Big Kipsters are big on, on some, some, you know, the Polar Express and Willy Wonka. Everybody knows the golden ticket. You, you know, the golden ticket gets you into the chocolate factory. Well, our golden ticket is your high school uh, acceptance letter. And so we feel like that's the next step in going towards your, the college that you want to attend. Uh, the high school choice is important. It plays into that. It's not the only thing, but it plays into that as well. So you go into any of the middle schools, KIPP Academy, there's a big wall with all these golden tickets and Episcopal St. John's, KIPP Houston, Phillips Exeter, Phillips Andover, Deerfield, you name it. They're going to these places, and those are their, their golden tickets. And I would say it's either choice or commitment. So whatever high school the child committed to, whether it's Northbrook High School or Exeter, that's what we want to celebrate in middle school because that signifies that the kids have made a transition to the next level on their journey to and through college. Do you want to talk about field lessons? Yeah, the field lessons are actually a nice internal debate as we all got our budget slashed this year. We used to try to show our kids a lot of a wide range of different colleges and universities. To me, the most important thing is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And if the squeeze is money, let's make sure the juice is worth it. And so what I think is more important than taking every kid to Pe University of Pennsylvania, every kid to Rice, God love it, is showing the kids a wide array of different universities and colleges as they progress through time. Because now my wife's the 12th grade college counselor at one of our schools. She's sitting with kids and saying, remember Trinity in San Antonio? This school's kind of like that. Remember going to the University of Houston? This school's kind of like that. A little bigger, urban, yada yada. So having the kids be able to reference some of those experiences helps them in their choice and selection on the match side. I think another uh, cutting edge program that we've added into our, our K Kip Through College repertoire rep is, is Red and Black financial, a personal finance program. I'm not sure how many of you, your students as they're thinking about all these amazing institutions re really recognize the cost involved, how much uh, their parents are going to be kicking in annually, and then just ask the student the question, well, what are you going to study after U Chicago? And if it doesn't really align to what it, it, it costs as far as investment, that's 60000 a year to go to U Chicago, or there are no plans for graduate school or research after that, doctoral, I would say, well, have you thought about another school in this region, in, in Texas, that might get you the same outcome at one-third the cost or one-half the cost, and then the wheels start turning. We, we, we have a red and black personal finance program where they have 16 lessons from January. It culminates in the middle of uh, April, and at that point, we put all, they put all their ex ex financial aid award letters on the table, and they begin to diagnose what makes sense in the institutional match the financial you know, piece of it. How does that play into the decision-making process? And they start to say, wow, I spent a lot of money last month on some other things, and I can use that same skill set to, to diagnose how I'm spending my money. And so just budgeting, whether it's time, this is another piece that I think that the kids have told us over and over, the most valuable component to college counseling at Kip just Houston. Quickly. Red and black are two women, they're sisters, and that one was born with red hair, the other was born with black hair. So they wrote a book, it's awesome, you should email Brian to get the contact information, and it's literally the story of their life, as one person had a personal tragedy happen, and needed to figure out an awful lot about finance that she'd never been taught. So that's what, it, it's not our school colors. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, moving along. I've talked about the programming. We have an alumni association. We're building amazing partnerships with our higher ed uh, colleagues out there. Uh, I don't know if I stressed it with this group, but in the last group, I, was, I think I stressed, you know, as we, as we push our, our post-secondary friends thinking about college completion, it's not just a secondary issue. It's not just us on the sending end. There have to be some shifts made on the receiving end as well. UT Austin is very aware of this. They're making changes. Their, their professors are talking to each other interdepartmentally now. They, they've never done that before. The economics teachers are ask, asking the English teachers, well, how do you ask students to write? And what are, what's the rubric that you use? And so this is some, some crazy work that we're seeing happening on the, on the receiving end, on post-secondary. But we, as a group, we, gotta, we have to continue to push our post-secondary colleagues and thinking through the, the format of delivery of how they teach our kids and then the content, age appropriateness of what the kids are going to be studying in year one. So just the partnerships are, are critical as we think this through as well. Some big chunks that I, I wanted just to flag for you guys as I think about middle school, high school, and then our KIPP Alumni Association. I'm sure that if you're running an AVID program in your schools, this stuff probably looks very similar to what you, you know, your, your, your scope and sequence might look like for any of those programs. But for me, a sixth grader, man, those kids come in, they are just all over the place. I mean, self-awareness and just ex exploration. We got to get them to kind of get a grasp on that. And how does that fit into the personal life planning of what's coming down the pike in seventh grade for them? or at the end of, uh, of middle school, where they may go to high school. Uh, they don't often think about that in a very deliberate sense, and that's that goal-setting, executive thinking piece that we, we, we impress on, on our sixth graders and seventh graders. Um, seventh grade, again, relationships and communications. Getting to your school leader or your principal that I was late today because my dad had a flat tire. Don't just walk in, Mr. Whitney says, why are you late? Mm -hmm and keep going. That, that's going to send the message that you do not care. Let's talk about how you send the message that you care. And so communication for our kids, it's, it's a daily battle. Uh, we work on it very, very explicitly. Relationships, again, KIPP is all about trust and relationships. We're small enough, we're nimble. I get it, you know, if you guys are large districts or bigger schools, how do you think about that and in, in, in capturing it in smaller houses or colleges or whatever you create on your campus to really think through adults having explicit conversations with middle schoolers about relationships and communication because that's critical. That's at the core of everything else that comes down in high school. And then leadership, and then we do high school applications because it's a big part of our, our work. We give kids the choice of you know, where they might want to apply to go to high school. We feel that's a very empowering piece. We help them understand that they may not be fit to go to Episcopal. Um, or that Kip Houston High School doesn't want them because they are a culture drainer. I mean, we have those conversations. And so high school applications are big. Leadership, self-advocacy, that's all you know, baked into that work as well. And then self-awareness, <coughs> career explorations and connections to pathways at life after college, life in your professional, you know, whatever it is you're going to do. How does that, how does that play into that college decision? What does that, what does that mean to go to UChicago? And, you know, we, we track them on through 16th grade. We have an alumni association. So we are with them every step of the way.